Hey, welcome to another episode of Soft Rep Radio. I am your host, Rad, and with me, I have a very special guest. Now, you are probably used to me talking to somebody who's a Green Beret, who's Delta Force, Navy SEALs, and, and that's not going to change here. We're just going to talk about the means of transportation over the years of conflict that this device, this machine, this beast, this soldier, this warrior has been on the battlefield throughout time. And I'm going to introduce Paul, who has written a book for you to enjoy. Paul, let's talk about Jeeps. I think I can handle that, Rad. You know, we'll see. We'll see if hey, I live Paul, up to your usual standards. Tell us the name <laughs> What would you of like me book? to talk about first? Tell me the name okay, of your book. Okay, actually, I... No problem. I've actually written three books, what I call on early Jeep history, okay? And I define early Jeep history because I can, because it's me, right, Rad? You know, just, you know, let's <laughs> make it up as no. we go along. I'm so excited. Right. I'm so excited to have this so, conversation about Jeeps. Yeah, no worries. So early Jeep history can break be broken up into three periods, the end of World War One to October 1940, uh, October 1940 to March of 1941, and then uh, March of 1941 to November, December 1941, just before we got in the war, okay? And okay. so I've written three books. The first book is called Project Management and History, and that covers the period up to October 1940 from a project management perspective. Then I wrote a second book called The Original Jeeps, and that covers the period f- going all the way from World War I to March of 1941. So we've got two-thirds covered uh, in the second book, okay? And in the second book, there's three Jeeps on the front, where the, which were the three original Jeep prototypes, and we go in in both of those books into – very fine detail of what happened to where someone on Amazon wrote about the original Jeeps. Uh, I'll be, I'll give it clear. Uh, this is yeah. a little by a little dry with lots of technical detail, but no book has been written that go, that covers the creation of the Jeep. And uh, that's better uh, covers the creation of the Jeep uh, more thoroughly. So then what I decided to do on the third book was to kind of make the story a little bit more accessible to people. Uh, we wrote, wrote and compiled what we call the original Jeeps and pictures. And it's uh-huh. an images book. And this book is the first one that covers the entirety of early Jeep history all the way where we get in where, when the United States enters World War II. So on the cover of this book, we have all seven of the original Jeeps, and uh, the book is very uh, readable. I had a friend say they could you know, read through it at, in an hour. So we've got three Enjoyable, books. Enjoyable. Huh? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Back- yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and again, the, the new book, which we'll spend a, you know, a majority of our time talking about, um, just wanted to make the story more accessible to more people that they could – Find out what happened through the images, and then if they want to go into the detail, they can purchase uh, the original Jeeps. So that's kind of the sure. overall uh, overall story of the books. Okay, that's awesome. And so you're, you're is up, there uh, – <laughs> yeah, no, it's awesome. See, the reason why I was so excited to have you on, on the show today is because, uh, you know, a lot of folks don't understand that Jeep and Ford – and, uh, you know, Ford Willie's Jeep had this uh, relationship back in the day uh, to try to get government contracts to go mechanized. Right. So we're trying to get, you know, uh, beasts on the battlefield other than horses. And uh, they're like, we need something that can, you know, take a beating, uh, you know, fit some troops, uh, take wounded. How can we get wounded out, you know, by using litters on the front of the hoods? I mean, you know, let's talk. Right. Let's get into it because, you know, the Jeep is combat ready in like five minutes yeah yeah so that's absolutely 100 percent correct and so the overall story is uh as you stated right around 1940 the germans were marching across europe full you know much more mechanized modern for that time uh, Mm -hmm. armies and the United States realized, yeah, we need a vehicle to replace the mule and the motorcycle with sidecar for all the things you want to talk about. And mm-hmm. in May 1940, they had exactly uh, nothing. <laughs> nothing. nothing. Nothing and nothing on the drawing board. Nothing. Right. Zip. Nada. 
And that was literally two weeks. They realized this two weeks at a meeting, two weeks after Hitler invaded the West in May 10th, 1940. And then through us an, ex- an amazing, miraculous set of circumstances, which people don't really know about. And that's why we've wanted to document in our books. The Jeep came into being between that time in May and delivered the first one in September on September 23rd, 1940. And, and then a miraculous story. It's literally miraculous. pretty quick. Yeah. I never stopped using the term amazing. Yeah, it was it was yeah. really quick. Yeah. Four wheel so, drive. You know, capable of uh, being uh, dropped in a crate and having a small man unit that's attached to the vehicle uh, drop with it, airborne style if they had to, uh, assemble it uh, if it landed correctly and didn't break apart. And then they could put it together in like five minutes and they were mechanized now in some, you know, Eastern right. European country. And the other yeah. thing, which is amazing. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, no. I'm just like, I, was gonna say, the I, other- I just love it. Yeah. Yeah, Keep like, going. whoa. Yeah, the other thing that was amazing <laughs> about it is, you know, once it created, it, given the nature of the war was coming up, it could operate in any theater, anything from desert to Europe to the Pacific to, to China, Burma. It didn't matter. So yeah. that is even more remarkable that a, that a vehicle that versatile could be created that quickly uh, in, in, you know, in 1940. It, it's just it's just amazing. It is. And uh, you see a lot of these videos. You can go probably look on YouTube and find the, uh, you know, how to assemble it. You know, there's like uh, guys that do it right. as a as a five minute stopwatch type of thing and or how to uh, how it was first created. There's video where they're going over these bumps back in the day in like an old Willie's Jeep and right. they've got, you know, troops in it and he's bouncing all around, probably banging his head on the edge of the, you know, of the right. frame. And they're just trying to get what happens to a soldier in those conditions. So what did Jeep have to fix about that? You know, there had to be something where it's like, we got to have some suspension. It can't just be knocking our soldiers around. What? How, how did they come up with that? Um, if you want me to go back and tell you kind of the birth story, I think I can answer that question that way. Does that make yes. sense? Yes. Let's do All it. All right. Yeah. So you're in May 1940 and they have nothing. And stepping back, there was this, car company that most people never heard of called the American Bantam Car Company, which was based in a small a small city in 30 miles northeast of Pittsburgh called Butler, Pennsylvania. And that company had spent the entire, through various means, they had spent the entire decade of the 30s, which wasn't exactly a great economic time, by the way, in case anyone's wondering, a little thing right, called depression. the Great Depression, you know, just a slight thing. So... <laughs> Uh, Bantam tried to build small cars for the United States, and shockingly, it didn't go well. And so in 1940, the company was bankrupt. They had no staff. They had nothing, no capital, nothing. They were just, we're going to, boom, fade into history. And they took one last roll of the dice, one Hail Mary pass, and they said, let's see if we can get some government contracts. So they hired a guy to go to Washington and rummage around, see if they could find something. Well, long story short, this gentleman named Charles Payne ends up in May 1940 in the office of the infantry, which had been looking for a vehicle of what we're talking about for three or four years prior. And he ends up in the office of this guy named Colonel Oseth who literally was at this conference I was mentioning earlier where they realized that they had nothing. This conference was held in Baltimore, Maryland, at a place called Camp Holabird, which was the Army's main depot for uh, procuring vehicles. So this Othis guy is at this conference in May. They're talking about this type of vehicle. They have nothing. He goes back to his office, and who's sitting in the windowsill but a guy, Charles Payne from Bantam to try to interest him in, in – um, uh, contracts for the war. They were looking for airplane parts, and 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 El- Oseth comes in, says, "Who are you?" And he's like, "I'm you know Charles Payne from American Bantam." He's like, "Yeah, what are you doing here?" He's like, "Well, I want to interest you in maybe uh, you know looking for air because the uh, our, the Air Force was on the Army at the time, Air Force, um, yeah, you know aircraft parts or we build vehicles." He goes, "Well, we've tested your vehicles, which you have, and they're no good." So Payne was the consummate salesman. He says, well, what can we, what can we do? What do you want? 
He goes, right. I know Colonel Oseth had been very involved in the um in the develop in the tests that they had been looking for a vehicle the last few years. So so keep the story short. Osa says, I know what we want, and if you work with me, I we will develop a general list of specs to start a procurement for a vehicle. Osef says, thumbs up. And over the next two weeks, those two guys, primarily with other people in the infantry office, work together and create a general list of specifications for a vehicle that will meet this need that we're talking about. And that memo was written on June 6, 1940, which, let's test your history knowledge, what happened four years to the day exactly after that date? Uh, D-Day, correct? D-Day, right? You can't make that up. It's right on the memo. No. It says June right, 6, 1940. Right. It's like, oh, my God. So D-Day, four um, they years come up prior. With those, this, <laughs> yeah. yeah, four years. I hope I said four years later. Did I say four years no, prior? No, you did. You did. No, you did. Four no, years later. I'm glad I said the right answer. Oh, oh it's my bad. You know, hey, hey, special ed work for out. me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you got it. You know, I really That's wanted to try up. to make the question hard. Anyway, so four years later was D-Day. Exactly. You can't make that up. And um, – so they now have a general list of specifications created in two weeks of what they're looking for for a vehicle. So the, so the journey had started. And in the original Jeeps and Pictures, one of the things we did is we included among the images the actual documents that, oh, wow. that, that, that throughout the procurement. And the June 6, 1940 uh, document is in the book. I could try to show it. Do you want me to try to show it from the book? I yeah, sure. Then the viewer the that might that. be watching us on YouTube could take a peek at it. Right. And uh, the listener, it's just really the documentation right. showing, you know, it needs to go right. to war. There it is. It probably can't see it, but there's the June 6, 19 memo, page one, oh, yeah. right? The actual document that kicked every single Jeep wow. that's ever been built came from that document so people can actually read and i included both pages of that significant document so people can read it if they want that's a a huge that's that's very significant that's that's like we need this vehicle and that is the jeep and you know my understanding and you can correct me if i'm wrong is jeep stands for just everyday essential parts like they wanted it so simplistic to be able to build that's one of i've heard that acronym what do you think well, that's where they put the list of specifications down, and they did want something that was in that vein, um, that would be that that versatile. Uh, but they really didn't know what they wanted at the time, okay? They kind of had a general idea. I can move into the next part of the story if you want to kind of try to explain that. To, yeah, do know, that. Get to the point where I have to get that. So what happened after the June 6th memo came out, what Oseth had done is usually items are are procured for the army through the quartermaster, and Oseth was mad at the quartermaster, so he put a, put an item in the specification so that this particular procurement for this vehicle would go to the ordnance department. Well, long story short, it goes over the ordnance department, and the ordnance department ordnance department says, "We don't procure vehicles. We don't have a clue. <laughs> we don't we don't know what to do." So they go, you know what? Why don't we go visit the Bantam plant? So they they go up and, and they make this decision on June 17th. And they say, you know what? We're going to go to Butler from Baltimore. Butler on June June, uh, 7, June 19th. I get my dates right here. Uh, June 19th, 1940. And so they go up to the Bantam plant because Oseth had started this, right? And they have a two-day conference. And they come up with fleshing out more of what this vehicle should be and could be. OK, and so that is a, a major moment. But I just love the part where like it goes to the ordinance department. Rad, be like you and I having a meeting gone. Yeah, this is a we, you know, we, we're ordinance. We blow things up. We don't, yeah, we don't like, create vehicles. You want, hey, yeah. hey, dude, you know, I'm not, you know, old guy saying dude doesn't work well. But, you know, hey, 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 man, we don't do this. <laughs> yeah. Right. So if I, if I could show one other, I'll show another thing from the book. So out of that meeting, now this is going to your point, right? They, yeah. they created a drawing which we call the Beasley Brown drawing. I don't know if you can see it there. It's, I got my, let's see, how am I doing? All right, let's try this this way. There we go. This page of book. Oh, yeah. So if you can see yeah, it yeah, there, yeah. that Top now side you're starting and, to see a vehicle, uh, front, right? Yeah, you're seeing the views of the drawings. You see the rear, the side, and the overhead of a Jeep 
on page one, and then on front the and then next to it is the front axle where it shows the grills, which that's a different right. Jeep. But well, yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. But that's that's going to go to your point. So that is the first drawing of a Jeep type vehicle. Now going to your point, they wanted it to be four year wheel drive, right? And four wheel drive yeah. was very new in 1940. So what they did is they called in. That's what that next page was. There was mon- one manufacturer who could manufacture a four wheel drive vehicle. They called him in. And on June 20th, they had a discussion about the axle. And that was going to be a key component if they were going to be able to successfully create this vehicle. So now you've got from literally May 20th, 1940 to June June 20th, about a month, you're now starting to see a vehicle come about. Wow. But they still have more it's work amazing. to do. So it's pretty cool. So that's – that's uh that's that part of the story. <laughs> so, 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 so did he, did he create that axle and have, what was his name? Do you know, remember his name that created the axle, the guy that had that? Oh yeah, I could go into that. So let me, so the axle was going to created by a company called Spicer Manufacturing and they wow. were, you know, uh, ironically located in Toledo, Ohio, the same city as Willis Overland. Okay. So, We'll go, we'll go through it this way and answer that question. So they go back, and now they've got – the ordinance department has a little bit more idea of what's, what they're looking for. But then the Army bureaucracy kicks in, okay? And long story short, OSETH didn't want the quartermaster to be involved. And after they got back, by the end of June, the Army bureaucracy said, no, this vehicle is going to be procured by the quartermaster. And that's just uh-huh. the way it's going to be. So have fun with that. So it goes over the quartermaster that over the next three weeks from June 20th, uh, 1940 to July 10th, 1940, about three weeks, they created a detailed specification and a more fuller out drawing of what this vehicle could do that they could send to a manufacturer that they could build. So in the axle, they were having the conversations about, hey, we're designing this and we need to, uh, the axle is going to be imp- uh, important. So they were having conversations with Spicer about, mm-hmm. hey, are you going to be able to create the axle? They said, we're going to have to modify a Studebaker axle. We've never done this, but we think we can do it. They eventually did do it, which will come up in later on in the story. If I can show you this next one. Yeah, sure. No, by it. all means. Yeah, because so, I'd imagine if I was the guy. Now, this oh. is World War II, and the effort everybody at home is to support the 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 the, the war effort. So everybody, like you're mentioning, people right. from you know uh, Toledo, Ohio, uh, Studebaker. Uh, you know, you're talking about you know places out of Pennsylvania coming together to try to create this. Right. You know, this new American flag. <laughs> I don't know how else to right. to say it because you know I kind of get. I don't know. It's like not annoyed. I guess a little, when I see an American flag on a Jeep, I'm like, why? Why are you putting that on there? What do you? <laughs> I already know. I already know, bro. You don't got to sit there and you know, fly. <laughs> I know. That, that, that is the flag to me. I see that those seven slots. You know, boom, and that's just right. me personally. And, and being created with that in mind for the war effort, everybody at home was putting something into this machine, and so there's more to it than just probably you know. It's it's a nation's idea. Right. That's a very good point. It's already becoming a national American thing. You yes. got Toledo, you've got Butler involved already. Um, you have people in the army in, in Baltimore and Washington, DC. If I can show you, see if I can get this up on the screen this time better on the right hand page. If you can see that drawing, that is the drawing that they put together. And I think you can, uh-huh. you might not be able to see it, but it's in the book where you can kind of see a very, very good Jeep-type vehicle coming together, okay? Yeah, you do. And so you that do, drawing you, do. you can see the front yeah. wheels. So, you can see again, the wheels. Dra- sure, sure. Yep. So that drawing. That book's going to be great. Uh, she get the book. Yeah, right. <laughs> definitely definitely yeah, get, the, get book. the book. Look, yes. And we'll keep talking about it. Let's go. Keep going. Okay. So moving on to the next segment of the story of the Jeep's uh, creation – I don't like to say it was invented because it was really created, all right? Because yeah, yes. vehicles were there, the specs and everything that they were looking for. Not any single one was unique, but 
them combined the way they did, that was unique. <clears throat> yes. So the next start of the story is uh, Banoff thinks they're going to get a negotiated contract. The Army says, yeah, no, you're not. We're going to send this out to 135 companies and see who will bid, and we'll give people 10 days to put the bid together. Well, Bantam doesn't have any staff or any resources. So they scramble, and they put together their bid, and one of the issues with the Jeep procurement was the weight that the Army said this thing's going to be is 1,300 pounds, okay? Mm -hmm. And how did the Army – now, this is what I was a project manager. This is where requirements are hard, Rad. They didn't ask anybody that was actually going to build the vehicle how much it should weigh. So they just came up with 1,300 pounds saying this is going to be between the half-ton truck and a motorcycle with sidecar, so it's going to weigh 1,300 pounds. All right? So Bantam has to scramble, puts their documentation together. They go down to Washington, D.C., and they have a meeting, and the engineer that was they had hired to help them put the documentation together <clears throat> uh, had put in 1,800 pounds for the weight on the bid form. Well, Charles Payne, who I mentioned earlier in this late night meeting, literally blows a you know blows a gasket. Yeah, says you can't put eighteen hundred pounds in there because they'll just say no because it's overweight. So they actually had to call a stenographer in the middle of the night, retype the forms, and put in the weight of twelve hundred and seventy three pounds. They just basically lied because they couldn't yeah, they build. Came in. Nobody could build this vehicle. No, no nobody could build the vehicle for thirteen hundred pounds. So no. here you and they just showed they got the they got the bid forms retyped up literally, you know, within an hour or two before they had to show up at the meeting on July twenty second, nineteen forty, at ten a.m. Can't make that right, stuff right. up. I just love no, that. That's, stuff. that's so, why, and they're willing to say, you know I'll what, eighteen hundred pounds. It's still eighteen hundred pounds, though, right? It, they're just saying thirteen. Oh yeah, they, <laughs> They're just saying twelve seventy five, twelve seventy three. Yeah. It they, yeah. they knew they couldn't. They knew they couldn't build it for that. But you know what? Bantam was bankrupt. So if they didn't get what, the contract, what? who's going to care? The, exactly. So, you know, they're going to go <laughs> bankrupt. So, you know, they're, they're, they're pulling out all the stops. So I'll finish up that segment of the story. So they go to the meeting, and there's another bill, bidder there. Actually, there was four. Ford came. They said we won't bid. And I'll tell you why in a second. This is a key part of the story. There was uh, Crosley came. They said we can't bid. Tell you why. Willis came in, uh, and they had a – T- they had a time of materials and a handwritten bid because they had, didn't have a lot of time to put together. And Bantam had a fully typed, beautiful bid with uh, documents. So they, they, the uh, quartermaster uh, representative named Colonel Laws looks at everything, says, I'm going to go back. We're going to talk about – it's like the old car dealer – just the car dealership thing. We're going to go back in the back and talk about this with the supervisor. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, come on and tell you how it happens, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, here's what the manager, manager has to say. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. He, yeah. Like, so, he, <laughs> so he comes back. He, so he comes back in, and he says, well, after looking at it, Willis has the low bid. And Bantam is like – they just they almost hit the floor and faint, right? Then he goes, but Willis says they they can only build the vehicle in um, 70, 75 days, and the Army had stipulated they had to build the vehicle in 49 days. And everyone considered that impossible. It was impossible. But Bantam didn't care. They said, yeah, we can build in 49 days. No problem. Yeah. Thumbs up. So Bantam gets the contract. Yeah, but that's right. how they got the contract. It's that's like, crazy. Are you kidding me? You can't make this up. Oh, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Well, when someone's going to do it. Detail. Someone has to make it. And if he's not going right. to try, if he can't do it, then who's going to do it? If if the army's demanding it, the yeah. army is very demanding and wants everything for nothing. And this dude has put everything on the line to try to get this contract. And they're now teasing yep. him with other uh, distributors, like Willie uh, uh, Ford. You know, he's like, yeah. uh, brah. That's right. He's like, brah. I brought this to you. Like, what are you doing to me? So, so can. Continue right. with that, Bantam, That's please. exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Please. So then, so what? what happens is, so then what is Bantam gets the contract? They finalize the contract, and on, by August fifth, nineteen forty. So Bantam has forty nine days to do the impossible. They're betting yeah. in Detroit was five to one. They wouldn't get it done. Right. Now the people at Bantam were amazing, amazingly mechanically amazing, amazing engineers, but they had some staff there, which we won't go into, uh, but there, it's in the, it's in all the books uh, that they were mechanical geniuses. So long story short, they build the vehicle, 
circling back to your excellent point, Spicer delivers the axle on September 15th, 1940. Okay. Yep. So Spicer comes through with the, with the, I, I, I think I could use the word revolutionary axle. Bantam finishes, finishes up the vehicle on September 21st. Oh, and I forgot to mention. So from 49 days from August 5th is September 23rd, 1940. Okay. So they finished the vehicle just putting it together. Okay. On September 21st, 1940, they test it a little bit for a day. And they drive it to Camp Holabird on September 23rd, 1940, the literal 49th day, and pull into the depot at 4.30 p.m. on half an hour before the deadline. Literally right out of a Hollywood story. Yeah. It's like, are you kidding me? Again, I use this term all the time. When I talk about early Jeep history. Can't make this stuff up. So Bantam came through and they got the vehicle <laughs> built and delivered it. On the 49th day, they did the impossible. So that's going to your point about people see Jeeps, love Jeeps. Yeah, they don't right. realize that this amazing vehicle that's been around for 80 years was created in a miraculous fashion in, right. in 49 days. And I don't use that term lightly. So that's pretty cool. That, yeah, that, I is. love that part of the story. So No, that is it's a um, wonderful part of the story. And so, right. and, so, and so talk to me, talk to me more about how, you know, now they got the axle. They've got they've got the you know the contract that's been delivered. Uh, how did they decide on the slots on the front of the Jeep? Where did that come from? Well, the slots on the Jeep. If you look at the original Jeeps, uh, the first two, the B- Bantam. So Bantam named Nine. their vehicle the Bantam Reconnaissance Car, uh, and okay. the Willis Quad. They had a rounded hood, and I, I don't remember how many things they had. Where the seven slot grill came about, that actually came out came out after the war. When Willis okay. wanted to build civilian Jeeps, and they had to differentiate their Jeeps. So they made the seven-slot grill and, and patented it or copyrighted it, whatever the right term is. So that's where the it. seven yeah, slots. Yeah. So you'll see a lot of the Jeeps Jeeps in the war. They didn't have seven slots. Okay, they might No, they had, had like nine, nine or 13, on, on didn't the they? Didn't, didn't they have like nine yeah, or 13 slots? Yeah, I don't know slots? exactly. And, and yeah. that was Ford Willys. I don't know exactly. Jeep. Yeah. Right, the Ford, the Ford, the, the it was the Willis Jeep and the Ford Jeep. I can let let me talk about a little bit about what happened after they delivered the vehicle. Yeah, do then that. We'll talk do a that. Bit yeah, about Willis that. and Ford. So yeah, go for it. what happened after they delivered the vehicle? So now you got to understand that they built this vehicle, just barely got it built and delivered. Right, they're not delivering it to a, a group that's going to be like, you know, I think we'll, you know, take it easy on it, see how it works, no. you know, you know. Gentlemen, no, they're going to try to break it in every way possible. Yes. And the Bantam vehicle, they tried for six weeks, they tried to break it. It bent, but it didn't break. And by the end of October 1940, the Army accepted the Bantam BRC and ordered another 70, which was in the original contract. And the Army had a vehicle. And that's wow. what I always find amazing about the story is how good were these guys that they could create that vehicle in a miraculous time. And so well that it stood up to the toughest testing any vehicle would get from the army. Again, that's a, another one of those. That's a wild great moments. story. It really is because you got yep. neighbors trying to help neighbors because the young men that are going to war yep. are depending on these, and those are the young men that were neighbors to these men that work in the factories. Women back in the it's crazy. Yep. World War II was a, a a unique time that uh, my grandfather lived through, you know, and uh, served in the navy and whatnot. And so I just know that talking to him before he passed away. It was just, a, everybody was all hands, you know, it was a really cool time. And, and knowing right. the Jeep comes from that. Exactly. So one of the things we could talk about is uh, how Willis got involved was, this is another one of those things of the story. After they didn't get the bid in July, the army cut a side deal with Willis and said, if you build a vehicle on your own, because we're wonderful people, we'll take a look at it. Sure. If you build it on your own at your own expense. So Willis built their prototype at their own expense. And then October 1940, just so this is where we can get people together, where how did you get Bantam, Ford, and Willis? In October 1940, mm-hmm. the Army went to Ford. Actually, literally, the quartermaster approached Ford and said, would you build a prototype? Ford said, sure, why not? So by the end of November 1940, the Willis and Ford prototypes were delivered in uh, November 1940. You had your three participants that you mentioned mm-hmm. Bannon, Willis, and Ford in the mix. 
Yeah. And so that's kind of in the brief version. And then again, that's detailed in, you know, all in the, in the uh, original Jeeps and the project management history in the first Jeep. And we have, you know, images and detail of that in the, in the uh, original Jeeps and pictures. So by the end of November, 1940, now you have three prototypes. And I, the next part of the story I can briefly talk about, it's really, it's kind of literally a melodrama. So between October, 1940 and uh, March of 1941, the army, when Bantam delivered the vehicle and was accepted, they said, yeah, now what do we do? <laughs> and yeah. then November 19th, and then now we have three, you know, you know, the making it up as they went along thing. They go, and now we have three uh, vendors. So through an amazing set of circumstances that are detailed in the books, they ended up o- offering contracts to all three vendors for 1500 with uh, Ford's and Willis's contracts uh, dependent upon their prototypes being accepted. Sure. In January of 41, January 41, the four, early January 41, the Ford prototype was accepted and they, they started building their 1500. Bannon was already building their 1500. Willis, the quad, actually failed the testing. And through another amazing set of circumstances, they were reinstated and given their 1500 contract anyway. <laughs> well let me ask you something and it's like it's like yeah go ahead what where's this axle at now that bantam had what about the axle are they all working with the same individual to get that axle or has ford now go ahead that's my question no no i was gonna say that's absolute. that is a fantastically that's a great question they all had to work through spicer yeah. So you have three manufacturers competing <laughs> for this vehicle, and they're all getting yeah. their axle from the same supplier. Yeah. Another yeah. one of those like, ironic quirks. <laughs> hey, man. It's like Dr. Hey, why are you Pepper. giving the axle to them? <laughs> yeah. right, well, why are you giving the axle to them? So yeah. the Bantam, uh, the Bantam, Willis, and Ford prototypes all had a Spicer axle. Yes, they Because that was the only one that could build it. And going to your point about it was an American vehicle, uh, both all th- uh, not so much Ford, maybe, but Bantam and Willis, they used a lot of off the shelf parts and those parts lists are actually in the books. Hmm. So they came from everywhere. So, again, sure. the American vehicle concept that you were talking about already being built into the DNA of the Jeep. Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, you know, it is. Yeah. It's Jeep. Jeep life. It has its own it's hashtag Jeep. that trends all over the world, you know, on social media. Hashtag Jeep life. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's now, unique. And yeah, the so those they, th- create, they create the vehicle they drive. Go ahead. Now those three, those three, those three guys are involved. Uh, three companies, and you've got Spicer with his, yep. you know, unique uh, piece of the puzzle. Honestly, that that allows all yes. the wheels to move. You know, uh, at the same time for snow, uh, mud, uh, wet terrain, uh, steep terrain. It's a climb. It's trying to be a mule, yep. which a mule can climb a mountain. It's trying to be a pack horse, which can haul a lot of gear and be quick and haul troops at the same time and weaponry. So when do they start getting into like the testing weaponry hey. phases with like, yeah, tell me. Well, that's a pretty good question. How about we throw a camel in too for the desert? Right? Yeah, about, right. Like, exactly. Right? They had to, had to right. operate. So, so it's going to be a camel too. And, you know, I, I can't think of anything from the uh, jungle that it might, you know, we could relate it to. Oh, lion. that actually is the lion. perfect. <laughs> no, it's called a lion. No, the rivers, the you rivers, know, the river, you know, the Nile. <laughs> right. <laughs> or uh, no, the Amazon, you know excuse we, me. <laughs> the Amazon. You know, you know why we could do that, Rad? Here's why mm. we could do that. Because it's us. It's our interview. Yes. We do what we want. Yes, it is. No, so it's true. That's your question. <laughs> Go ahead. Your, your, no, your, your no. question is the perfect, perfect segue into the final third of the story, uh, March of 41 to no- November 41. So 1941 was dominated by four events. And the first is exactly what you said. The Army said, okay, we've got three vehicles. We're sending it around the country, all three vehicles to be tested. So I've called 1941 the year of testing. They tested them thoroughly. In July, they said, you know what? Now, the original contract with Bantam in ni- July 1940 was for 70 vehicles. They didn- I don't know if they really knew how big this war they were going to go into was. Next yeah. thing you know, literally a year later, and with the expansion of the war, then July 1941, they said, we have enough information. We're going to go out for another bid. 16,000 vehicles, winner take all. 16,000. 
Jeez. It was like a twelve million dollar contract, which was real money back in the day, right? That's huge. real money now. Huge. So it is it's huge. They send it out. Yeah, huge. You're getting you're starting huge. to get the kind of expenditures that was gonna happen for this war. So oh, yeah. Bantam, Ford, and Willis all bid, comes out, and the quartermaster says Ford is gonna get the contract. And everybody says now that knows a little about the history says, well, wait a minute. Willis built the vehicle. The, the quartermaster had to send the contract up to a higher level for final approval. And that higher level said, no, Willis has the best vehicle at the lowest price. Willis will get the $16,000 contract. And they did. And the quartermaster was furious. They were overruled. Oh, yeah, <laughs> the right. bureaucracy. So that that is another one of those little gems in the story of we didn't have the Ford GP. We had the Willis MB. Can I tell you how we got the Willis MB yeah. moniker? Yes. Yeah. Real quick. So, yeah, please. After the, the, the Willis quad had failed, Willis went back and did an amazing job retooling their vehicle. And they had it done by May, June 1941. And they renamed it the Willis M.A. For military and – here, let's see if we get this question. Why do you think they called it A? <laughs> it's not that hard. A, 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 assault? <laughs> what? No, no. A is the fir- A is the one of the, of the alphabet. The letter? A is one of the alphabet. It's a You're letter, but no. it's, it's the first letter. It's the first yeah, letter. The first I stumped you. I it's see. the first yeah, you got me. So this is uh, this. Right, I got <laughs> you. Like, I, sorry, sorry about that. You know we should have. I should have. Like, we we should have prepped up on these questions before the test. Letter. Before the hey before man, we're the, real. Uh, interview. This is but yeah, this but is our you, interview. You, you, it's yeah, our right, interview. We're, we're, right. It's <laughs> interview. So the point is, you got to love how simplistic this stuff. is. You know, where did the M A come from? Right. right? Uh, well, we'll just call it military, and we'll just use the letter A because it's the first letter of the alphabet. M A. Yeah. Exactly. So what oh, happened? You know, M A. Right. Yes, and they only built right. They only built 1,500 of these. So we're, we're, right. why I'm bringing that up? Fast forward to the story. Willis gets the 16,000 contract, and they the army working with Willis made a lot more, even more changes uh, than they already had over the prior year. And by the time they got done with the, all the changes, uh, Willis said, "You know, this is sin- so significantly different. So I think we'll re- we'll call this version the MB." Because that's the second right, letter. The the second letter. So that's how you got the name, <laughs> the second letter, second letter of the alphabet. So yeah. right. So that's how you got the Willis MB moniker, the Legend of World War II, and that's how you wow, got okay. to the Willis MB. Why, why don't I finish up the last part of the story, the fourth Please. part of the story, and that'll Please. give us that'll have the complete picture for people. So the last part of the story is. Um, Willis now has the MB. They have a contract for 16000 And the Army goes, now it's later in 1941. The war is approaching. Things are really deteriorating. And they go, we're going to need a lot more of these. And we probably should have a second supplier. So the Army went to Willis and said, we have a deal for you. It was a godfather deal. They said, you know what? I think you Ford should build your vehicle under license because they want it to be standard. But they yeah. wanted another manufacturer. And they basically went to the, uh, you know, Willis and proposed that. I like to go, it was an offer they couldn't refuse. <laughs> they, Willis said, deal sure, for you. no problem. We got car a deal, deal for you. No it's a problem. car deal. They can build our <laughs> it's a car deal. Listen you know, to this. Willis only really needed this, needed this, this, um, this uh, work. And, I, and there also was probably a sense of patriotism in there. So, yeah, for sure. The, the, con- the, the, the licensing contract was signed. Ford's now going to build the Willis vehicle under license, and Ford had named their vehicle, uh, the original vehicle, the Pygmy. Then their improved version in 1941, they called the GP. The G stood for government, and the P stood for a wheelbase of 80 inches. So what they did is once they got to the point they're going to build the vehicle under license so people understand where the Ford GPW came from, which was built for the war, that stood for GP Willis. (laughs) <laughs> so that's I how you got GP. So now we're at the point where, yeah, we're at, right. We're at the point in the story. Uh, the early Jeep history is completed and you now have the Willis MB and the Ford GPW ready to be built for the war. And they built over 600,000 between the two of them for the war. Wow. Yeah, they pumped those out. 
That is a lot of Jeeps. That, they that did. A lot of Jeeps. They did. That that is a lot of Jeeps. I'll tell you, that's a commercial they run. Did. You know, like what they did right there for, for oh, a yeah. few years. What was that span? What was the time frame of the six hundred thousand? Just the war. Just the war. Just the war. Uh, nineteen forty-two like, through 19- just the war. Forty. Just like a two to three year span uh, was six hundred thousand. Yeah. So two hundred thousand a year they were pumping out. That's why they wanted Ford. That's why they said, "Hey, we're going to license this through Willys." The Willys created it. Ford, we need you to help produce this because you know Hitler has to die. Yeah, and the Japanese need to be beaten. Yeah, that's exactly so, right. Yeah, and uh, yeah, because yep. that's exactly that's crazy. And so, so we have this Jeep now. It's been deployed. It's all over the place. I have a friend who lives in England, around the London outside London area. He has yeah the Jeep over there. He has a regular Jeep Willys tricked out. Drives it through the countryside. It's windows down. It's green. It's exactly what it is. He's like, anytime you're over here, I'll take you for a ride in it. Paul, this is a shout out to you and your Jeep over in England, my friend. I just want to let you know we're thinking about you. But <laughs> it's it's literally in England still, right? And I'm like, you know, over here we yeah. have a, you know, I think of the desert rats back in the day for the SAS running in the desert with their pink, you know, Land Rovers with their windows down. Those, yeah. those you know, that, what the CBs having that, you know, uh, the grates on the sides of their vehicles and such, you know, and then you have the yeah. army uh, showing up with theirs now, right? Here it is. It's able to work in Africa. It's able to work all over every continent is what they tried to get it to all around Jeep. That's what's up. So now what? So up. now the, so now the war effort has happened. We've picked and pulled everybody's parts off of the different shelves from their stores. The wars now won. victory has been announced. Jeep does what? Well, the good news is, for your listeners, is my area of expertise is early Jeep history. Yes. So my expertise ends when we enter the war. There's many other people over the last 80 years that have covered the war and after the war in great detail. But yes. no one, as I mentioned, that, that, that review on Amazon about no more thorough book has been, has been written about the creation of the Jeep than my okay. books. And that's what people can find out in detail and all this amazing history. But, you know, what happened was, though, I do know generally what happened, okay, so I can answer sure. your question, <laughs> is they, and going to your point, because of the war, so you have the, a quintessential American vehicle, it goes to war, and it becomes the quintessential vehicle for the world, just through the war. And then what happened yeah. after the war, I have a brief epilogue, what happened after the war, a uh, Ford said at 1945, we're done with Jeeps. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Willis wanted to build vehicles for the civilian market. Uh, They tried. Willis eventually faded into history in 1963. The Jeep didn't. Um, And Bantam basically after 1940, because they did not get the – Bantam built 2,670 Jeeps. And after Mm. that, they never built another vehicle. And they went bankrupt wow. in 1956. And so, but the Jeep brand, what they talk about the Jeep brand. Uh, and so you've seen all the various types of Jeeps over the decades, you know, oh, da, 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 Willis Jeep. And then I like it always it cracks me up. AMC actually owned the Jeep brand. You remember AMC? <laughs> yes, American I do. Motors Corporation. You might be a little yes, young I do. for that. You know, I always no, bring that I up. Know. The Pacer, one of my favorite cars from my childhood when I was a kid. So the point is the Jeep brand, they call, I don't want to say they call it the Jinx. Are, but they just it, it has literally been bought out and changed hands almost every 10 years since the end of World War II. Interesting. Every 10 years just gets bought and changed out. Yeah, it's interesting. Right. It's, so right so now it's like Daimler That's kind Chrysler, of an overview right? of what happened. I think that's what it is. I think it's Daimler Chrysler. Well, right Jeep. now, I, let me see if I can go through the lineage here, at least off the top of my head. So you had you also Willis know Daimler had Chrysler's it. making got, the M1A1 oh, A1 Abrams. Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. Um, if my memory is correct, uh, Willis uh, had it after the war. They got bought out by Kaiser, became mm-hmm. Kaiser Willis, eventually Kaiser became trucks. the Kaiser Jeep. Yeah, the Jeep, right? yep. That's so right, then right. Kaiser got bought out, I believe, by AMC, all right? And AMC had it for a while. And I think after AMC, it went to Chrysler. Yeah. And then Chrysler went to Damler Chrysler. 
Then Chrysler went bankrupt. Daimler Chrysler went bankrupt and became um, uh, not a uh, I forget, Cerebus I Capital Management. Remember that one year? Cerebus <laughs> Capital yeah. Management. Yeah, you're diving Whatever in that there. Means. You know. Build a vehicle. You're the man. Right. This no, dude is not, the man. And He's then, like, then, <laughs> and then in the late 2010s, they shuffled all the deck again and said, now we're going to be Fiat Chrysler. That's what it Automotive, yeah, that's FCA. Right, that's right. That's and right. then I think that, right, then I think the most recent reshuffling was we're going to take Fiat Chrysler, uh, Fiat Chrysler, uh, FCA, and we're going to merge that with Peugeot, and we're going to call it Stellantis. So the Jeep brand is now under Stellantis, if my memory's correct. That's interesting. <laughs> now, 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 I'm yeah, so excited to have you on, Paul, to talk about the birth of the Jeep. And and I just want to bring up that I do own a Jeep, right? And I'm just sitting here listening, and I know that the CJs, which is the civilian Jeep, which is after the Willys market, with the round headlights, you know, uh, started to have kind of right. like, you know, a hunting uh, you know, application to the civilian. Um, and then you started seeing the Jeep, you know, go from the war to maybe, you know, um, government auction or surplus. And then people were driving them around the town, you know, um, for everyday grocery pickup. And so they started to say, okay, well, the CJ is a, a hunting vehicle. And so it had a, it had some rollovers because more civilians are taking them out, climbing up hills and rolling the Jeep, right? So now you have roll bars installed inside of the Jeeps, the whole nine yards for that safety factor. But in the 80s, um, Jeep wanted to change that whole dynamic. And you know about this, right? How they changed their headlights. Uh, you could you could go into it. That's not my okay. area of expertise. No, so. let me let me explain. So, so the 1986 Jeep comes out because they call it the YJ. So they go from the CJ to the YJ. And the reason why they go from the CJ, civilian Jeep, to the YJ is because they wanted a Jeep that was more city-friendly, urban-friendly. Someone in New York City might want to drive the Jeep to a dinner. So they wanted to make the YJ. And the YJ stands for Yuppie Jeep. So what they did was they said, okay. we have this huge this huge um, decline in sales because of the rollover fact. A lot of folks are rolling. So someone in their marketing team, now correct me if I'm wrong, someone out there on the internet, go ahead, come at me. They said, I got an idea. Let's change the Jeep because it's square with square headlights. And so they changed the headlights right. to being square with the Jeep. So when you look at it, it doesn't look like it wants to roll with round headlights. And so the marketing team said, oh, okay, well, let's see if this works. So from the time of like 1986, 87 through 93, 94, before the uh, TJs came back with the round headlights, Jeep sold around 780,000 Jeeps. It was the most jeep production sold because they said hey square equals flat equals no rolling then what did they do once they got rid of that whole rolling debacle was they went back to the round headlights and the tjs and all the current jeeps today all have the round headlights and so you know you uh i just was wanting to have that tell you that i know that <laughs> It's, that's that's great. That's great history. And the thing is, that's what's really wonderful about the Jeep story. I go into, you know, the early Jeep history in detail and then in images in the current book. Uh, but there's so it's such a rich history. There's so yes. much of those types of stories and out there on Jeep history that if a person wants to learn more about it, they want to learn about early Jeep history. They can purchase my books. And there's other books that go into all that type of history, too. So it's a it's a wonderful area of history, uh, the Jeep, for sure. It, it really Now, Paul, Paul Bruno, ladies and gentlemen, tell me your website about where we can pick up your book. Uh, we'll have that put in the in the um, post here so that if anybody's reading, they can click on it on the website. Tell us the name of your website or where they can pick it up. Rad, I have a fi an official name for this particular segment of our show, and that is this yes. is the blatant plug part of the show. <laughs> so like we have head. a website. Um, <laughs> right, right. Go, boom. We have a website called originaljeeps.com. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of an honest person. We haven't updated it for the current book, the original Jeeps and pictures, but it, there's a lot in there for the first two books, project management and history and the original Jeeps. My books are available at amazon.com exclusively. Other than Thanks. if people want to purchase a, autographed copy they can go to dispatchermagazine.com slash books 
dispatchermagazine.com slash books. Um, the original Jeeps right now uh, is available for autograph. We're working on the site to get the first book, the Project Management and History book, uh, the first Jeep out there for autograph. And obviously, we want to get the current book, the original Jeeps and pictures out there for autograph. So hopefully, that'll be out and available for autograph copies through that particular website by the time this show drops. I need one of those. Yeah, yeah. It should go up uh, in a, about, on a Thursday in about a week or two. But yeah, I definitely want one of those as well so I can have that in my in my collection. I'll have to get one of those. Yeah, if you want an autograph copy, go that route. If pe- people just want a yeah. regular copy of any of the books, just go to Amazon.com and type in the title and it'll come up and away you go. You know, you know, Jeep has, uh, you know, its own culture, its life. Uh, you know, there's many crews and clubs out there. Uh, I'm a part of the Utah Jeep crew here in Utah. And it's just like you get together with your Jeeps and everybody says, what's up? And you see all of us come together. And uh, I think that the Jeep community throwing up a peace sign whenever they see each other is just so unique. Uh, you know, it, it just really, it really is. You know, that's the way it is, you know, when you drive a Jeep. And so... I'm excited to see the future of the Jeep with the four by E that's coming out. You know, we've gone from, you know, World War uh, two to, you know, uh, multi fuel by, uh, you know, electric Jeeps. And so, you know, here in Utah, they're always doing rock claw- crawls down in Moab. And uh, the other day I was reading somebody's uh, review of it and they said that their Jeep was just so quiet. It was just going just great. The four by E climbing, everything fine. It just wasn't as loud as the, the Jeep in front of it. <laughs> so right. it's quite an interesting, you know, uh, growth that the Jeep, and now there's new little Jeeps and they got all sorts of Jeep lines, right? Like you said, like Fiat and, uh, you know how they're all this other company, but, uh, I guess I just get excited about Jeeps and to my listener that loves Jeeps, go buy Paul Bruno's book, do it. Tell him Rad sent you get the autograph copy. Paul Bruno, you've been a pleasure to have, uh, on the show, uh, as always, I want to say thanks to my dad who hangs out on the wall behind me in that American flag with his beret. And uh, I hope you enjoy the fire. We'll always have it on for you, Paul. Thanks again for being a part of Soft Rep Radio. Thanks for having me, Rad. I really appreciate it. Really enjoyed the interview. Thanks a lot. All right. Very cool. And my name is Rad. And if you got any comments, suggestions, or you want to be on the show, just send me a what's up through the Soft Rep. Hey, I got a question and I might just put you on the show. No problem. All right. Well, my name is Rad. If you got any questions, I'll just talk to you about them later. Peace.